also or something that flashed up on my screen um so the other things is when constituents um and constituency organizations um raise policy issues so they're wider issues so it might be um how a particular charity can work how um an, a, a group that's looking after disabled people might work and, and the issues that they throw up and both of those things inform the third role which is very much looking at more, um, more macro issues, national issues uh, that might come through into legislative um, programs. I mean, I, I remember reading about David Cameron and many of the things that he said he was passionate about in legislation came from issues that were raised in the constituency. So it's, it's like um, a hierarchy, I suppose, of, of, of following uh, the path, but it all comes down to what happens in your constituency. But what I'm talking about, I suppose, more than anything, is the role that I have in Parliament, which is essentially to be a legislator. Um, and that's a really complex process. I, I, wish, I wish we did more about it in schools sometimes because it's so complex. Um, and it's a, a system that we've got, which I think is, is, is a thing of joy and beauty in most cases, because it's involved over many, many hundreds of years. No one sat down and tried to invent a process from start. Um, in fact, many others have, have, tried, have copied what we've uh, managed to evolve um, over many, many hundreds of years. So our legislation evolves, uh, derives from the executive. So the government, uh, from ministers alongside civil servants. And as a backbench MP, it's not usually, there are ways I can originate legislation, but that's not always the, um, the, the it needs the backing generally of the executive to have that come. And obviously we see that start in the manifesto, um, but actually getting it from the manifesto um, actually through to legislation actually to get royal assent is a very very long and, pro and complex process and there's a lot of people involved in that so you've got the prime minister um, and underneath the prime minister you have uh, the cabinet the secretaries of state and then each secretary of state has a team of ministers of state and also parliamentary under secretaries of state and that's essentially the executive and then you have backbench MPs. And then in the middle, you have PPSs, and that stands for Parliamentary Private Secretaries. Um, and it's a funny role, but it's a fascinating role with you have a little bit of a, um, a foot in both camps, actually. Um, and my job at the Ministry, Ministry of Justice is to be, I usually sum it up as being the eyes and the ears of the backbenches uh, to feed through what the backbenches are thinking to the executive, to ministers, but equally to um, just be a sounding board for policies to the backbenches to, to, to see um, what kind of reaction various policies um, and announcements might have. So as I say, it's, it's, um, it's very much, and that's why I mentioned relationships to start with, because it's very much a, um, a job that requires you to build good relationships um, with all different parts of Parliament um, in all its different forms, including uh, the officials, in including the, the, the civil servants. So um, we're appointed by the Prime Minister, um, helped by the whips um, who make recommendations. So I have no policy or financial or statutory or operational authority. Um, I don't get paid for that this particular job. Um, and I don't get an, you know, a vast staff that goes with it or, or anything like that. It's very much but me. Um, but I am uh, the link between the executive and the backbenches in parliament. Um, and it's a fascinating opportunity to see a department at work. I get to work much more closely I mean and actually after I, I leave you I will be going over to the Ministry of Justice for a meeting and, I, and I'll explain what that's that's about later. Um, it's possible that I could uh, represent the Minister um, at various functions if uh, he or she can't make it 
Um, and I could even deliver a speech on their behalf if asked to. I haven't been asked to do that yet. But actually, I am not allowed to speak on a minister's behalf on any kind of policy issue. So you will you will notice uh, that I will never I'm not allowed to speak on any Ministry of Justice issue um, because that would be going beyond my remit. And that would kind of spoil the, the, the position I have that that link position that that would that would spoil it. So I am not able. Um, and there's a certain irony that. Um, part of my interest um, in the Ministry of Justice but because I have a bit of experience and I have a passion for what goes on there but I, and now I can't I can't get up and speak and I have to sit through debates sometimes not being able to to speak which is very frustrating at times. Um, so um, I'm also subject to the ministerial code um, which means um, you know, just really behaviour and um, not accepting any interests which is I guess more more um, relevant to some of the things that have been happening over the past few weeks. Um, and also, um, because I'm, I'm also subject to collective responsibility, which means that I am expected at all times to vote with the government. And I'm expected at all times to not say um, controversial, um, contrary things to uh, what the government is trying to do. So that's, uh, I can see some smiles and I, I think that is an interesting element of the job. Um, I mean, that, that, that is, you know, in a, in a way that's not as, as, as problematic because we're all working as a team to, to achieve the same ends. But it does mean that if I wanted to rebel, if I wanted to vote against the government on any issue and on any vote, I would have to resign as any minister would from that position. So I would have to, to resign the, the position as, as PPS uh, because it is collective responsibility as affects the cabinet and, and all other ministers. So um, in, in, in a visible sense, um, if you look in the chamber, um, you see the front bench ministers um, in debates and you will, all, even when it's quite an empty chamber, you will always see someone sitting right behind uh, that front bench, the minister on the front bench behind the, the dispatch box, um, and that is the PPS. So the PPS will sit in debates behind their minister. Um, and you, you'll see in PMQs, for example, the prime minister's PPS, and because you can only, they're always truncated because the cameras only show part of them. You'll always see um, Sarah, she's always got a big file out. And um, as, as the prime minister is answering questions, um, if it's something uh, from an opposition member, for example, who's got no idea what it is, she'll be ripping pages out of her file and throwing them over his shoulder just to, to make sure he's got any information that he might need to try and help him through um, PMQs. Which is, so I hope I hope that helps you next time you watch PMQs about some of the things that actually goes on. And also um, one of the things, and this is the most basic thing. Um, you'd think in some ways that you would use, you know, telephones or WhatsApp or anything like this, but actually the convention is um, that if, if a minister wants to um, speak, communicate with his officials, his or her officials during a debate, um, the officials sit in a box and it's called the box uh, behind, just behind and to the left of the speaker and any messages uh, the PPS has to get up and go and fetch. So the minister might hand me a note um, over his shoulder and I would have to get up and run around and give it to the officials in the box um, if the, he wants to ask a question and then I'll have to go and get the, uh, either wait or get the answer in the form of a note. Um, or if the officials want to communicate, they'll start waving at me from the box and I have to go and get the, the note and give it to the minister. Um, so it's quite an old fashioned thing. But again, I think that's part of the tradition of, of being in the chamber, which, which is quite nice. But that's not a particularly skillful job. I can, you know, act as a as a post post boy or girl. That's that's not difficult. But um, there are there are some things that I do try to do, for instance, um, if there are papers that he needs that he hasn't got, I would obviously I, I would make sure I've got everything. 
I, I would have every piece of paper that he might need so that I would support him. And my job is to support him in terms of, of getting through the debate, ask, answering questions, making sure he's got all the information he or she needs. Um, and as part of the whole process of communications, one of the things I also do is arrange um, direct communication between ministers um, and the Secretary of State um, and backbench MPs. So uh, that can be an MP might phone me and say, I've got a real issue with um, a development uh, or no justice, it won't be a, a prison in my constituency. We've got a prison. And then I will organize for he or she to meet the relevant minister. And I have regular, we have regular, they're called tea room surgeries because MPs, you know, we have the tea room, which is a very um, central part of where we mix and get a cup of coffee, get something to eat. And there's a little section at the back, uh, which you can book and we have what they call tea room surgeries. And uh, ministers will literally sit, maybe sit there for an hour and we'll have a string of different MPs. Um, and it means that, that we have the ability to raise directly and specifically issues with ministers and secretaries of state, things to elevate things that, that constituents want raised. And if there's anything particularly urgent, then, then you know, it's a really good and direct way of making sure that backbenchers have access to ministers and that's I mean we use it all the time all the time and it's a really uh, impo important part of, of what I do um, there will always I will always a minister will never do that on their own in a formal sense um, they'll always I'll always be there and officials will always be there as well so that, that there's a formal record of that meeting and that the follow-up happens through the department so that's um, a really interesting thing um, and I get to see how ministers then follow up um, on those specific um, issues. So it's, it's, it's a really useful way uh, for me to learn how that happens. Um, as I say, in my case, I was appointed just over a year ago. Um, the reason, I, th I think the, the reason I was appointed and I was appointed to the Ministry of Justice, I'd sat on two major bill committees. My father was a police officer. I was a magistrate. So um, I had a particular interest um, in the area of criminal justice um, and policing. And because of that, I was asked to sit on two major bill committees, the domestic abuse bill and the counter-terrorism bill. Um, and they were joint uh, bills with the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice. So I think knowing my interest and you know a little bit of experience and expertise in justice was the reason that I was appointed, which as again I suppose it is why it's slightly frustrating where I sit in a debate and I'm absolutely itching to uh, contribute um, but I can't but, but that's fine because I have plenty of other things that I can um, I can do. Um, so I have uh, we, there are two PPSs in the Ministry of Justice. There's one uh, PPS who looks after the Lord Chancellor, so Dominic Raab, um, and I take, um, which I think is the more inter interesting role, I take the rest of the department. So I have um, four ministers, or five actually, because we have a minister in the Lords as well. So I have Kit Malthouse, who is the Minister for Crime, who is a joint portfolio with the Home Office. Tom Persglove, um, who also is a joint mandate with the Home Office. I have Vicky Atkins, who does prisons, and uh, James Cartledge, who does courts. Um, and as I said, we have Lord Wolfson, because many departments have a Lords Minister. Um, and I always thought, well, why are ministers in the Lords? But now I realise, because actually you really do have to get your business through the Lords uh, as well. So it's um, absolutely vital to have um, your representation in the House of Lords as well. So the main issues that we're looking at um, primarily now are courts, the backlogs in courts, which um, have obviously um, it's very difficult physically to do. Ha it has been to have social distancing in courts, which has slowed the court pro uh, process down. So there are backlogs in our courts. Um, prisons, um, prisons have coped very well during the uh, pandemic actually the the um the 
prison officers and prison governors have done a fantastic job of protecting prisoners. They were predicting thousands of, of COVID um, infections and deaths in prisons at the beginning of this pandemic, but actually the prison service has done an absolutely sterling job. Um, and you, you'll know you have not heard of that uh, to any great extent, and that's a big, um, you know, you have to pay a great tribute to the people in, in prisons for, who have stopped that. Um, so we have responsibility for the probation services, uh, organizers, uh, organizations such as CAFCAS, which is the Children's um, Liaison Service, Coroners, Criminal Indus Injuries Compensation Board, Legal Aid, Youth Justice, you name it, um, the Minister of Justice uh, has something to do with it. Um, as you know, during, during the time I've, been, I've experienced a reshuffle where my former boss, um, Robert Buckland, um, was consigned to the back benches again and replaced by Dominic Raab. And we had a slight change of, of minister, ministers, but, um, but that, that's just, you know, uh, I suppose the king is dead, long live the king. We carry on because the work of government has to, to, to carry on. Um, so the biggest issues I would say that we're looking at at the moment are the violence against women and girls, uh, strategy and the rape review. So an, an all encompassing um, several pieces of work about violence against women and girls. Um, the court's backlogs is still a big issue and it will be for some time. Um, and I today, I just finished um, one piece of legislation which was the judicial review and courts um, bill which has just finished its committee stage today. And the big piece of work that will now, I think, consume a lot of my MOJ time um, is a major piece of legislation, which is currently in the Lords, uh, which is the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. Um, and as I say, that is an enormous, enormous piece of legislation. I just happen to, to have the bill there. Um, it's, it's huge. And actually, it will be bigger, I think, by the time we finish because it's still only halfway through its um, progress in the Lords. Um, and just to summarise, I, I don't want to go on too long, but um, just to summarise, violence against women and girls, you'll be aware that um, the prosecutions and convictions for rape are at a historic low. It's absolutely horrific, something like 1.4%. So um, the government's just carried out a rape review, um, which has led to a strategy with various um, uh, it's, there's no one silver bullet, but it's a range of changes uh, to procedures, uh, policies, which we hope uh, very much will improve the conviction rate um, for that. And then that's things like uh, tackling rape myths. It's like extending sentences. It's um, emphasising in courts and the CPS are focusing on the perpetrator, not the victim. Um, and things to, to keep women in within that process, because a lot of women find it a very distressing um, process, keeping women in the process rather than dropping the case. Things like uh, women used to have to give up their phones um, because the, the prosecution and the defence used to you know, need to look through phones for evidence. And those, their phones would be gone for months, literally months. And some women would just say, Do you know what, that's my life and, and, and I can't. I can't cope without it. Now uh, we're, we're absolutely making sure that's a matter of days um, and pre-recording evidence um, at the time when the, the rape is, is reported, for instance, that helps, um, that can be court evidence. So that uh, stops a woman having to keep going through um, that evidence time and time again. So there are lots of, of things underlying that to, to try and improve that. Um, there was a huge call for evidence um, for a violence against women and girls strategy. Um, there had been several thousand uh, responses to that. Um, and then the, the dreadful uh, crime against uh, the, the murder of Sarah Everard happened. We reopened that and we got something like another 40,000 um, pieces of evidence for that. Um, so that, that was very good. And, and there will be a whole strategy coming out of that about safer streets um about how the cps and the police respond to reports um uh, honor-based violence domestic abuse stalking harassment uh, so that will be a big piece of work um coming out as well but 
as uh, the, the big piece of legislation to look out for is the we call it the PCSC bill, Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, um, which is a huge piece of work um, covering a, a lot of different areas. And, and one of the problems, it's a great thing because it's a very, very major piece of legislation, but it's also what um, is a new term to me is called a Christmas tree bill because so many people are trying to add baubles onto it. So people see something to do with criminal uh, sentencing. And, um, and this is why actually my job's very important because lots of MPs are saying, well, do you know what? In my constituency, uh, and this is a live case, this is, um, it's called Ryan's Law. So in Cornwall, there was a, a case of a, 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 a driver uh, who was suspected of being over the, uh, the, the drink uh, driving limit uh, but killed uh, a man and left the scene of the crime and went uh, home and cannot be convicted because he wasn't breathalyzed in time. He wasn't found in time. So um, it was he, the only charge he could be um, convicted of was actually leaving the scene of an accident um, because there was no other evidence. Um, and he got something, you know, four months for, for killing someone. So uh, we're looking at legislation and, and the MPs um, who, uh, you know, have been approached by the constituents, it happened in their constituency, are now trying to have what, what they're calling Ryan's Law to uh, increase sentencing for people who leave the scene of a crime where it is a serious or fatal accident. So, um, as I say, this is a good thing because lots of MPs have their own things that they want brought into the scope of this bill. So there's a there's a big job for a PPS to be again to communicate that to ministers um, and also to um, help that communication process where MPs are trying to explain to ministers why it's so important and ministers are trying to um, to formulate a way if it's possible to to bring that into the scope of the bill. So, um, but some of the things in the bill are uh, introducing into law a police covenant. Um, which will, um, it's like the armed forces government making sure that, uh, that, that our, uh, our police uh, personnel are looked after um, and treated um, and get rights to mental health, um, trauma counselling um, and so on. We're looking at unauthorised encampments, um, police powers over demonstrations, which are done differently. Uh, it's, it's due to the fact that um, groups like uh, Extinction Rebellion don't march anymore and the law has not kept pace with uh, the different ways that people uh, protest so we needed new laws to do that. Pet theft which actually came very much from MPs from backbench MPs are uh, recognizing that a pet has more value than a bicycle to, to families and so reflecting that in sentencing. Um, new court orders they're called protection orders and um, about uh, people who carry knives, uh, prosecution orders, not protection orders, assaults um, on emergency workers and possibly retail workers, which is another thing that backbench MPs have been lobbying for, um, and uh, increased uh, sentences for uh, dangerous driving. That bill is currently in the Lords. Um, we think it could come back from the Lords with up to 300 amendments which is, it's quite gobsmacking, really, 300 amendments. It might not be that many, but, but we'll see. Um, and then it will have to go through ping pong, where it goes from the Lords to the Commons, and there will be a series of votes, depending on whether we accept the Lords amendments or reject the Lords amendments. Uh, and ping pong is a fascinating, I, I, I think it, it's, um, my background was in banking. It's, it, to me, it's like a negotiation, but it's a legislative negotiation um, where it goes backwards and forwards. And, and whilst these things are being voted on, very rarely or, or very often, they're not actually decided. There are still negotiations happening between, um, between the Lords and the Commons, between ministers and backbenchers, between uh, the government and the opposition. So it's very much a moving feast of, of, of negotiating. And, and as I say, I'm, I'm I feel very privileged. I'm in the middle of it. Um, and whilst it's like juggling a hundred different balls, and I think when I when the PCSE bill comes, it might be more than that. Um, it's it's a fascinating insight into the process, the process by which our laws are made. 
um, and and it's quite taxing, but it's absolutely it's very very re rewarding. Um, and also, I have the the ability to put my own ideas in. I have made some suggestions, uh, particularly in the violence against women and girls uh, strategy, and and I'm talking directly to the Lord Chancellor about how we might um, get those ideas off the ground. So it's a, it's a great privilege to, to not only be part of the whole pro process, the parliamentary process and the legislative process, but also to, to try and make my mark in, in some small way. So um, I'm a bit of a canary in the mine um, and I'm hoping you will know if I'm fretting, if there are huge controversies on the front pages of the newspapers about the police courts and crime, police courts, crime and sentencing bill, I will be losing sleep. So um, keep an eye out. That, that was, that's my Christmas for you, I suspect. <laughs> but if I leave it there, Gordon, because, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to leave time for questions and I hope that wasn't too, too boring. No, no, not at all, uh, Julie. Thanks very much. A fascinating role and it's not a role that I really understood. And uh, to think that uh, our member of parliament is centre stage and much of what we see in the news is, is, is wonderful. Right, questions. Um, Colin George has had his hand up from the moment you started speaking, Julie. <laughs> you need to unmute, Colin. <laughs> right, while you do that, I'm going to invite Jim. Jim yeah, no, I've got it now. Oh, you've yeah. got it, right, okay. Yeah. Shall I, I have my question? Yes, please, Colin. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm just wondering um, how you managed to uh, formalise um, or making sure that you get a cross section of views from the party. Um, does that mean you attend certain meetings of the 22 committee or, I mean, you, you, you know, you're yeah. both in a, you're 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 both a facilitator, but you're also a gatekeeper, aren't you? And, That's a uh, really good question. A really good question. I should it, it proves something I've missed out actually because yes, I I I kind of um I'm that relationship um sort of facilitator with backbench MPs. But you're quite right, backbench MPs also some of them, not all of them group themselves into to different groups. So the One Nation group, for example, we've got uh, the Red Wall MPs uh, who have their own group. We have um, one called uh, the Common Sense group, which is more to the right of the party. You, you know, um, we had, I mean, some of them are, are kind of a little bit old fashioned. We used to have the European Research Group. We've got the COVID Research Group, but you're quite right that there are different groups and um, oh, we've got the social justice group, which is Ian Duncan Smith's group, for example. Uh, so there are different caucuses and groups within the party. And it's absolutely vital that we capture all of those because they will have different views on different elements of different pieces of legislation. And my job as that canary in the mine, if you like, if I wasn't too, um, uh, to make sure I knew what the views of all, all kind of colours and senses of the party were, then you might miss something. And then you might have an issue in terms of um, how comfortable or uncomfortable people are with particular parts of legislation. And just to give you an example, I mean, I, mean, I've, uh, I think it's next Monday, Dominic Raab is meeting. Um, I've arranged a meeting with the One Nation caucus. So that's an opportunity for that group of, of MPs to sit down and talk about anything they like. And they've got the Lord Chancellor in front of them to talk about any aspect of legislation, policy, um, you know, any, anything that's coming up. And it's a, it's a chance for the Lord Chancellor to test out some thoughts and, and get feedback on different things as well. But you're quite right, there are groupings and it's absolutely, I try not to be a gatekeeper, <laughs> I'm not stopping. It would be, it would be the, the wrong thing for me to do for, to, to stop any views from getting back to the ministers and the secretary of state. It's very much my job to make sure they know what people are thinking. Thank you, does that answer your question, Colin? Well, <clears throat> what about the gatekeeper role though? Because uh, there must be a queue <laughs> to get to the minister and to an extent you have to manage that and that can make you very unpopular, I assume at times, or, or well, is it possible to you know, not avoid that problem? 
a potential problem. Yes. Yeah, do you know what my job? I don't see my job as a gatekeeper. My job mm -hmm. is to make sure that backbench MPs get to see their minister or get to their issue raised with the minister, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I expect that as an MP, um, you know, for instance, if I take uh, Michael Gove's new ministry, um, I expect if there are issues and there are, and I'm trying, <laughs> I'll say that I'm trying desperately to get a meeting with Michael Gove as we speak um, through his PPS, because I expect ministers to be available to talk to me about issues that affect my constituents um, and it's absolutely vital the whole system would fall down if that doesn't happen so and there are questions that um, MPs come to me um, with and I can answer their questions if they've got a particular question about you know what's going to be in the, the you know the next bill I can I can I can often answer that question because it's a factual question um, mm -hmm. I can keep them updated so I can answer some of that but but certainly when backbench MPs want to see uh, and communicate with ministers it's very much my job to make sure that they get to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Tatchell. Hi Julie. Hi Jim. Good to see you. Um, you just a, a thought that I wrote down as you were talking um, quite a lot of the um, the reforms that you were talking about that are inside the bill are um, toughening up sentencing um, for things that need toughening up, obviously, that's fine. But what I was going to ask you is what innovative ideas have you heard recently about prison reform and about how prisons work? Because what occurred, again, was that prisons are kind of Victorian and a lot of the cases that you know they're a, they're a Victorian concept I suppose to an extent and and also the buildings are to an extent um, and also the view that is that the, the view is Victorian that they work to discourage and reform offenders and we know now that that doesn't always isn't always the case so what other ways with your expertise generally you know about this stuff and you've been looking at it for a while what other ways can we achieve those aims of actually discouraging people from doing breaking the law in the first place and reforming them in prison once they have? What, what else can we do? Glad you asked that because I'm absolutely passionate about that. Um, having been a magistrate and visited various prisons as part of, of, of my magistracy work and being in court, um, what I absolutely love it, it, over the last year, um, under Robert Buckland, mainly when he was Lawn Chancellor, there was um, a big white paper, a big piece of work on prisons and probation, which is coming together in the PCSE bill. And I would say the thrust of that bill is tougher sentencing in some areas. So um, dangerous driving, drink driving, uh, rape, serious, violent offences, some tougher sentence in there. But there is a whole different thrust of that bill. And that is um, trying to, to, to make prison work and to keep people out of prison wherever possible. So you ask for some of the innovations. One of the examples in the bill are problem solving courts. Now, I think this is a brilliant idea. Um, and it's something that magistrates and judges I know do, they try to do, but this is a whole new court where the idea is to get to the bottom of a, an individual's offending and to try and address the reasons for that offending. And it will have more power to um, bring more solutions to the table. Um, so it might be drug rehabilitation, helping offenders um, get work, um, helping if it's, if it's an issue with um, debt, you know, to get debt um, advice and, and get, you know, multi-agency uh, approach to solving the problems that are underlying that individual's life that is making either making them offend or stopping them from keeping offending because they're in this cycle so so that's one of the things and one of the other things that I think that it's a two-pronged thing um it's there's a there's a phrase that it's relatively new to me but it's it's neuro neurodiversity so it's um there's there's a horrific st statistic that something like 70 percent of the prison population um, have some kind of um, 
uh, autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia, um, some kind of underlying um, educational uh, difficulty. Um, and the idea is to get much more, much more resources into prisons to help deal with those underlying um, issues as well. And also, you'll have heard over the last few weeks, um, Dominic talking about more um, prison inmates working in the community. And I mean, paid, paid work, they won't get paid while they're in prison, but actual proper uh, work. So um, there are there is a call out for employers to take on prisoners, for example, because the chances of people uh, offending are cut hugely if they have a job, a, a job to go to. You know, it's that outside the gates thing, you know, as they go through the gates, what is waiting? And the idea is to get much more support as they come through the gates. So it's very much um, innovation in this new bill. So it's, it's a two pronged attack to, to cut, you know, to really clamp down on serious and violent offences. Um, but also to um, to be much more innovative and thoughtful and proactive about trying to help people in prisons um, and that danger of offending. I mean, that, that's exactly what I was hoping you were going to say, because it's you've got things like social prescribing <coughs> in the NHS, where they try and keep people out of doctor's surgeries by looking at the cause of the problem. So why don't we do that in justice? So it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and I just want to put my hand up that volunteering helps too. Yes, You know, I have a, a particular interest, so we all do, as, as our Rotary Club, um, in volunteering and supporting that, um, that project. So that's still live and going forward. So, you know, that's a great way of helping ex-offenders to integrate back into society by, um, by helping them to do positive things for themselves and for the rest of us by... Um, by volunteering so we'll try you know, that in it's so important jim and, and it is and and you know everyone will realize and and you know that that will probably not get the headlines unfortunately yeah. what will get the headlines if it, if, it, if the headlines you know are attracted you know to this bill it will be on um encampments it will be on um increased sentencing for something it it will be uh, some of the more um you know the tough line type of things if that that's not might not be the right word but equally important possibly more important um are the other things in this bill that that might not get the headlines but they're there that they're, they're, they're there and i'm really proud of them they're really good innovative thoughtful solutions thanks, thanks. I'm, going to, I'm going to pass on to uh, peter blaskos yes good evening um, um peter blaskos here you you've lifted the lid and described very eloquently the way of a sort of somewhat archaic system works and works brilliantly. I noticed, by the way, you you still stick to summertime in your office, but uh, that's <laughs> oh, <laughs> a minor point. <laughs> my my question is though, uh, if whether the Ministry of Justice and, and in fact the PPS is got involved or would get involved in an affair like the Patterson one, where it seemed to me that whatever system there is for judging MPs' behaviour. You can't call it a just and um, proper evidence-based system, and that's really what the uh, the argument was about. But does that come under your remit, and have you been involved, please? Peter, fortunately, not. Nothing to do with me. Oh, I'm I'm sure. to say. <laughs> no, uh, that has come. There is um there is a standards board, so there is a uh, there is a standards committee. Um, which deals with MPs, uh, standards, the, the policies, and, and also individual cases in, in uh, conjunction with the, the parliamentary standards um, officer, uh, commissioner. So, so that wasn't something that came to me until, you know, late on, like every other MP. Um, and, and I like, you know, many of us, um, I read the report, um, and I believed that uh, Owen Patterson had broken the rules. I thought it was fairly clear to me that he had. Um, but I was, you know, all of the discussions were, um, I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't had experience. Fortunately, I hope I never do of the parliamentary standards procedure. Um, but those who had, have, um, often come away with a sense of injustice, actually, uh, with it. Um, and there, there was a feeling that, that, that it was important to add on an appeal process. 
Now, what happened, as we all know, that that didn't that wasn't a good idea. It turned out that wasn't a good idea because it conflated the the live case with a bigger issue about, um, you know, the procedure and it didn't end well. And, you know, it, it was a, it was an unfortunate episode that, that we're still living with, unfortunately. But I'm very pleased to say that did not come anywhere near the Ministry of Justice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter Harper. Uh, uh, Peter Barber. Sorry. Yeah, Peter Barber. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Julie, I just wondered, once a bill has been drafted and is going through all the processes, as you say, of ping pong and one thing and another, is it possible if the government decides that they'd actually like to add something to the bill that they've either forgotten or there's been an event which suddenly creates such a huge amount of publicity that it it's clear it would be beneficial to add it in um like perhaps you know somebody's released on parole and commits 10 murders in a week or something stupid but um is it possible to amend a bill once it's going through the process before it becomes law yes indeed um, it does. It's it's a little known fact, actually. A lot of, of the publicity gets um, given to opposition amendments um, or backbench amendments. But actually, yes, the government all the time um, will add. I mean, I say all the time, but there, there will be government amendments and uh, look out for one tomorrow. I cannot tell you what it is, but uh, there will be an announcement tomorrow about an addition to the police court's crime and sentencing bill tomorrow coming from the government um and the government probably will come up with things sometimes right up to the last minute um we've just had the health and social care bill um it's just finished its third reading an hour or so ago and right up until the minister was on his feet um there were still discussions uh, and there's one that, that I mean uh, Gordon will be interested in I was absolutely fascinating it was um, new clause 19 um, uh, put forward by John Barron who's, a, who's a, a, one of our backbenchers but it was the it was be, it's been added to the bill right at the last moment it's about cancer care and outcomes um, uh, in the health and social care so right up to the last minute the government is still talking about what what amendments it will accept and it certainly can right up to the last minute it can it can bring in its its own null clauses or amendments to to the bill right up to the last minute thank you very much thank right, you next question uh, irene you need to unmute irene there you are evening julie um evening. it was very interesting uh, everything that you've been telling us one of the things that struck me was that you said that in your position as a PPS, you have to obey the whip. Now, does that, then there must be conflicts of uh, uh, times on that um, because it, you can't then vote the way your conscience wants you to vote. So that's, uh, the, the question of the whip is a very interesting one. Um, and it, I mean, it was it's a lot more important than I think you realise before you become an MP, you know, the, the importance of the whip. And of course, it's party management is an integral. It's, it's thought of as a, as a negative thing. But actually, as I say, I, I have a lot of sympathy and empathy for the whips because their job is to deliver the government's agenda. And actually, most people will say, and you see in the polls, that people don't like divided parties and people don't like parties and governments that can't deliver its own agenda. So I think we always have to go back to the first principles. And I know there's a whole new com there is a conversation we could have about our manifesto and, and what's been happening. But, you know, it's you have to go back generally to first principles, which is the manifesto you were elected on and that being your responsibility to deliver that to the to the best of your ability. Now, manifesto always is quite simplistic. There's a lot more to legislation than you can ever encapsulate in a manifesto, but the broad thrust of that is there. So it's really important to keep the party together to, to deliver your manifesto. So within that, I, I, I realize, you know what, there are compromises to be made within that. To get, to, to get that big picture, to, to be on that journey where you achieve 
what you were elected to achieve and the government and the party you're with, the team that you're elected with to achieve, there are, there are always going to be compromises to that. And I guess it's it's the level and the frequency to that that you can live with with that. Um, and I'm in, in, in a way it doesn't matter because that's fine. I would have to resign, you know, backbencher don't, doesn't have to resign, but they still have to go through the same thought process as I do. Um, and I think there's, there's a really important point to make also about rebelling and, and when you start uh, not taking the whip seriously, and I don't mean mindlessly, but you have so much more influence the closer you are. I, I believe that you don't do it lightly because I have more influence where I am now to influence ministers. Uh, and that's not for, for, for my benefit, that's for my constituency's benefit. And I think that's a really powerful thing. I'm a PPS, I'm a loyal so far um, uh, member of, of uh, parliament for the, for the government. And actually most of the things that I have raised as concerns and, and they have been raised, I talk about them privately and I talk about them before. And collectively, backbenchers can have a difference behind the scenes to influence legislation. And one of them was John Barron's new clause 19 today. A lot of us were going to our whips and to ministers saying, we really like this. We really like this clause. We think the government should include it in this legislation. And that has more of an impact beforehand than voting against the government afterwards. If you sort of mean, I, ho I hope I've described that. No, I, I'm very sympathetic. I didn't ask it to be controversial. I, I, I appreciate where you're coming from. And I think um, because at one stage I was actually in local government and uh, had the same problem because you mm -hmm. had to vote with your party, but not the same as you, because we could uh, we could avoid doing it without losing our uh, seat. Um, I just think it's hard for you because I don't think most of your constituents appreciate, which is some of the stick that you've been getting uh, about local issues, because they don't understand the point that you've just made, that the government manifesto is what you're actually all there to, to carry through. And you have to compromise sometimes on the local, on the local issues. So I, I, I was just interested to hear how you, how you explained that. Though. Thank you. And, you know, it's, it's local issues that are the, that are things that are, are so important to to lobby and it is lobbying behind the scenes, but I'm lobbying for issues and, and for solutions to, that, that, that suit Hartford and Stortford. That's that's my primary aim. And that's what I do talk to ministers all the time to get the best solutions. Um, and sometimes I talk against what the government's trying to do or, or say, go further. Um, but, and it's always on behalf of, of, of you know, what I believe is best and, and what is best for, for Hartford and Stortford. Yeah, but then, of course, you're seen to be voting perhaps the way that some of your constituents don't want you to vote. Yes, um, you certainly can't please everyone all the time, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> Th thanks, Julie. Next question. Oh, and Louise. You need to unmute. do that that's it yes uh you mentioned kafkas now I, I have an interest in that because i'm involved in a child contact center and we get some funding from kafkas but this year we weren't at all sure if we were getting it at all we have in fact got it in the bank now but um you know for those that don't know child contact centers where families come where there are estranged parents are able to come and have contact with their child and we are required to do this, and it comes under the Ministry of Justice. But and we do, we have this year got a grant from Kafkas, which was very um, late in coming. We didn't know we were going to get it. Most of our funding comes from voluntary contributions. So how do you reconcile this? That we we have to do this. We have to have these centres, but the funding is 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 very very um, tricky indeed. Um, and we're never sure whether or not we're going to get a little contribution from Kafkas. 
No, it's, I mean, funding is, is you know, uh, for almost every department, every part of every department is is probably a perennial issue. But I absolutely appreciate what you're saying about CAFCAS. And they do such an important job as well and such a good job. Um, I mean, in this case, we, we've only just had the spending review, uh, as you're probably aware. I mean, that's very much Dominic's um, responsibility. He took the uh, negotiations with the Treasury in terms of getting his funding for the Ministry of Justice. Uh, so that's all um, sort of caught up in that, really. So that was only a few weeks ago. I mean, I don't know if that's related to the, the late um, notice. I think so. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he did, a, he, he did a really good job. I mean, he got an extra, you know, half a billion just for court catch up alone. I, I don't know exactly what he got for, for CAFCA specifically, but, but it's all a negotiation. And, you know, in that, that Treasury envelope, every department has to negotiate the best settlement it possibly can. But um, but I certainly agree that CAFCAS is a very, very important part of the criminal justice system and the family courts and um, and everything that goes with it. Thank you. Thanks for that. One last question. Steve, have you got your hand up? Yeah. You need to unmute, Steve. Uh, hi. Um... Hi, Steve. Yeah, very interesting, that, uh, from what I was saying. Um, I'm not trying to act as a lobbyist here, but uh, a friend of mine who is a solicitor has said that uh, they could wade through a considerable amount of um, original or initial business on Zoom if they could actually defend um, in different areas by being at home or being in one particular position instead of having to travel around. Um, is there going to be any way that that's going to be possible to uh, alleviate the problems of this backlog in the courts? So I have just finished my last session of the Judicial Review and Courts Bill. A lot of the focus has been on the Judicial Review bit, but the courts part of that bill does exactly that. Um, oh. The main thrust of that, I, I, I love the question, Stephen, it gives, you, it gives me the opportunity to tell you what I've been doing for the last six weeks. Um, so a, a, a big part of the courts part of that bill helps is, is allowing courts to digitise a lot of the paperwork and use digital uh, technology a lot more, which will speed up and make uh, the courts more efficient. And the other part is to allow um, appearances uh, on um, zoom or, or whatever this virtual virtual technology the courts are yeah. using there is a new integrated courts system uh, because it's actually worked very well in the pandemic and actually it's like that that whole thing about you know uh, te technology and in innovation has actually compressed by years because we've been forced to by the pandemic and the idea is to use that um to to simplify to i mean not at the expense of justice i must you know there are lots of mm -hmm. safeguards in there but it is to use technology to improve um, the way the courts um, work and to help, that will help with the backlog as well. Thank you. Now that's, to me, that's, uh, that, sounds, that sounds the right thing to do, purely and simply, because if you can cut through so much bureaucracy and documentation work and get to the nitty gritty on it, if you see what I mean, um, you will probably cut down uh, on, on the pressure on some of the... Uh, approved uh, defendants uh, and solicitors that uh, find themselves um, pillar to post all round Essex and half a year. So yeah, I, uh, I think if what's, what's come from a pandemic, which can be seen as, if you can call, if you can call anything good, then maybe yeah. some of that might be able to be used. And uh, I'd like, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to hear that uh, that may be the case. Thank good. you. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you. you. Right, Julie, thank you so much. That's fascinating. We all thought we understood government by listening to the BBC, but I see there's a, there's a different side to it uh, when, you, when you get close to it. So thank you so much. It's been a fascinating talk and excellent questions and well answered. So thank you. So could I um, invite you all to join me in a toast to the Queen, Rotary, peace and health across this fragile world. Here's everyone. So I think you're off back to work now, Julia. I am. I'm going over to the ministry. We, we've got a session on uh, bill handling, which is why I've got a copy of the bill to hand. <laughs> OK, I hope it goes well.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Bye, Julie. Bye.